In an honest moment with my own spiritual heritage, I have to be confessional about that. And maybe you probably, a lot of you experienced the same thing growing up. My spiritual heritage said we were more spiritual superior than some others. <laughs> it's just <laughs> how we behaved. It, to be honest about that, we rationalized our axes to grind that we had against some other kinds of churches or our ability to tee off on this person or that person as holy. <laughs> I know a lot of that created a lot of problems and abuse even. So I do not say that lightly, though I say it humorously. In my own family, again, I think about my own Floyd family, how they did it. My father's side of the home was Baptist. The other half of the family of the Floyds were Campbellites. Most of you don't even know what that is. That's Church of Christ. The proud Floyds, those Baptist folk, would love to lay into a good Campbellite. <laughs> I'm looking at Lucille. Lucille knows what a Campbellite is. That's a, coming from a day gone by. We were more spiritual than that other part of the family. I listened to that as a child. I really did. When we'd gather here in Austin on 29th and a half in Lamar. Uh, I did not even know what a Campbellite was until I went to seminary. And then I got to study Alex who Alexander Campbell was. And I found him to be one of the most pious, well-intended religious persons you've ever met. <laughs> Little did I know as a child that was the case. Last week, as we talk about these kind of last traits of how lucky dogs behave, particularly how we as a pack of lucky dogs behave, we looked at the reminder that Jesus' last request, his last will and testament, his last words to his disciples was, Father, make them one as you and I are one. A prayer for unity. We do not want to ever treat that again as secondary. If someone says something to you on their deathbed, you will never forget it, right? That's what Jesus asked for. Make us one. Make them one as you and I are one. And he knew. He knew that his church that he was about to found would run off in so many different directions like a loose pack of dogs not staying together. And so here's what's happened. In this church we call Christ Church, there are a lot of us doing a lot of good work in all the corners of, of the world and including our own town. But let's be honest. How many churches are doing large, impactful work shaping a community, much less the world? Really? Mostly, our limited lack of influence and impact as a church has to do with our ability, or our lack of ability to cooperate with one another. And so we read today, if we think this issue is new, let me back you up about 21 centuries <laughs> to the words of Paul, who wrote these words from 1 Corinthians. And so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, <laughs> but rather as people of the flesh, or people who are worldly. Is that what that world word means? As infants in Christ, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now, you're still not ready. You are still of the flesh, worldly. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, and you are not, and, and, and you are not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations. I should say, are you not of the flesh behaving towards human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another says, I belong to Apollos, and you're not merely, are you not merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants, to whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. For when one says, 
I planted. You know I planted. You also know that Apollos watered. But it was God who gave the growth. So neither the one who plants or the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose. And each will receive their wages or reward according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants working together. You are God's field, God's building. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. And we say, we know about this church, do we not? This church at Corinth, the Corinthian church, my friends, was one of the most gifted churches in all the New Testament. When we read in the earlier, the, the, the chapters of 12 or chapters 13 or chapters 14, we read about their great gifts as a church. And they're all the whole array of gifts. But if you also read those first nine to ten chapters of 1 Corinthians, they were the most uncooperative bunch of folk maybe I have ever read. You read anywhere in the New Testament. They couldn't get along. And they were embroiled in this struggle, this struggle between over what is the greatest gift and who possesses the best gifts. Extremely talented, extremely uncooperative. And Paul calls them worldly. What do we call worldly in our olden days? We thought it worldly was what? We thought it was smoking, drinking, and chewing and going with the girls that do. What does Paul call worldly? Arguing, griping, complaining, quarreling, grumbling. That's worldly, fleshly. People are not impressed, my friends, with our ugly comparisons of one another inside the church. They don't want to be a part of another dog-eat-dog organization. No, not at all. They can have enough of that when they go to work tomorrow morning. If they perceive an uncooperative spirit in the church that somehow treats a charter member greater than another member, they will stay away. For they can find more tranquility, they'll tell you, and they've told me, they find more tranquility in the park with their pet than in the pew with some persons. (laughs) You know what you want, and you know what all people want. People want to speak for something, not against it. People want to unite around something positive, not be protesting something that they're against all the time. People are looking for a cooperative body called the Church of Christ, cooperating with every lucky dog. That was it. If we're able to cooperate with each other, every lucky dog. That's what will enable the church to make a larger impact outside these walls, in this community, and perhaps in the world. Playing well together with the other lucky dogs in our backyards. (laughs) But lucky dogs learn to cooperate when these things happen. When they grow up. Paul uses a metaphor of a child to to describe the lack of of cooperation. What does he call them? He calls them spiritual babes who, who he could not even give good food to because they were not able to cooperate with one another. If you raised a child, if you raised a child, you know they come to this world naturally selfish. It's just who they are as a child. And how many times do parents have to say, oh, would you two get along again? I want both of you. Stop it. We want you to get along. How many times that gets said in the house growing up? And do we not pray that we have to say it less and less every year they get a little older? Because as they grow up, hopefully, what are they learning? How to cooperate together as children in the household. I see some of you talking to your parents right now. (laughs) Oh, I'll take, let me get kids off the hook. You get married. What happens when you get married? You open your first joint bank account, right? You go deposit your first checks. 
And then you start spending the money as fast as you can to make sure you got your fair share out. <laughs> Eventually go, oh, what, honey, they turned the light bill. What's happened? To, who, did, did you, I, I thought you paid the light bill. If you let it go too long, you'll see your first flying saucer. It's just going to come from the other side of the table. <laughs> If a couple doesn't learn to grow up and cooperate. Grown up lucky dogs overcome this propensity for selfishness. They no longer only will say, I got to take care of myself and what I need. No, no they no longer feel that way. For if you feel you only have to take care of yourself, what you need, you reduce, if not diminish, if not make impossible, cooperation. Lucky dogs grow up, say, I, I want to cooperate with others. And that requires two grown adults and more for that to happen. But next, they learn how to not only cooperate, they not only to grow up, they learn how to value all gifts. Of course, Paul uses the human body in another place in Scripture in Corinthians to illustrate how the parts of the human body are equally valued. God gave us these gifts, and he calls us to these gifts to use them for this greater good, as we read in the text in chapter 12. Each person's gifts are then, as Paul says now in the chapter we read today, each person's gifts are to be employed for a specific God-assigned task in the world and in the church. And then that humorous way over in chapter 12, he talks about what would happen if the parts of the body had a mind of their own. He says the chaos would ensue if the ear says, I want to become a hand, or if the foot says, I want to become a knee, and the body would just fall apart. So don't you wonder what God thinks when Mr. So-and-so doesn't appreciate Mrs. Doodad in the church? Or Mrs. Doodad <laughs> wants nothing to do with brother watch him call it? Disregarding the values of others' gifts places members of the body in adversarial positions just picking each other off. Can you name times when you felt like your gift was not valued in the body of Christ? Not appreciated? Usually what's happening in the life of the church is one of two things. It's not the only thing, but it's usually one of two things. What happens is the body has become so self-absorbed with these small concerns about these little things. They're just all they can think about. And others' voices get hushed. Or they start worrying about what everyone else is doing or not doing. And others' gifts and values become undervalued. Under, other gifts become undervalued. And nothing will stop growth any faster than for any of us to say, I am not going to offer my gift to a God-assigned task that I know God has enabled me to do. And you say you do it because you're, not, you're tired of being of the complaint and the criticism. But if we do it well, my friends, if we're like Paul who plants or in a policy waters, who's going to cause growth? God is. Growth will naturally occur when we value every person who has something to offer in this place. And by the grace of God, we've all been given those gifts. And cooperation is a natural outcome when I recognize that each one of you has been called and gifted for the sake of a task. But this requires also that we learn how to remain humble. Cooperation calls for humility. We do not seek credit for our labors as we read in the text a minute ago. We only look to God for our reward if we are to remain humble. Here's, here's how I think, I don't know how, where this idea. We somehow think God is never going to forget my sins or my failures or my errors, but God somehow was going to forget to reward me for my good. Where did that come from? It's just the opposite. God's already forgotten your disregard and your ego ways. And God is ready to reward 
that which is your good works. That's a humble statement of faith that we all have to be ready to make. God has forgotten my sins, but will not forget my good, my good hands. I cannot recount how many times as a pastor in 40 years I've gotten in trouble. Oh, well, not just for this, but for other things too. <laughs> for forgetting to give someone the credit or to give the credit to the wrong person. I can't list how many times I've been in trouble for that. And the desire to feel like we have to be credited creates an unhealthiness in the body that makes cooperation elusive. Lucky dogs are humble, my friends. We know that one day our reward may come from whatever it is that heavenly wages may pay, but we also should know that there is a soul satisfaction of simply offering myself to that which I can offer to the world and in the place where God has assigned me and know that it's valued. We don't care who gets the credit because we're humble. And last, let me say this. Lucky dogs learn to partner with God. Partnering with God means we have, we, have, we have the ability to cooperate hand in hand. He called them co-workers of the text. We have the ability to cooperate hand in hand with all the other workers in the field, in the building, in the church. And if we, I didn't say this, guys. If we can't get along with others, what did it say? We are not cooperating with God. If we can't get along with others, we are not cooperating with God. God's cooperative work requires us to play well with each other, <laughs> if you want to put it that way. And the better we partner with each other, the better we reflect the love of heaven in the world. The highest form of partnership with God is saying, I want to cooperate with each one of you, whoever you are, because you have something to offer. And if we're quarrelsome and letting, not getting along with others, we are not cooperating with God. And frankly, it speaks of our immature faith. Our lack of ability to believe, you know what? God's working on you to redeem you just as much as God is working on me. <laughs> God's at work in both of us. And it stirs up a greater cooperation when I can esteem you. I can build you up, believe in you, value you. That's where cooperation comes from because we believe God is at work in each one of us as equal as God is at work in me so the next time you're tempted to complain about somebody down there at the church do a little inner inspection what does that do to your heart what kind of anchor does that place on your soul you're grumbling. Pastor, you just don't know the kind of cantankerous and honorary people I have to deal with. <laughs> we can't cooperate with irritable folks, my friends. Because if God's love has been shed abroad in my heart, and I'm partnered with God because of the love and grace of God I've received, that love will reflect itself out to others, even the honorary that we may have misnamed. Aren't we tired of working against each other? I've watched a long time churches working against each other. Independently magnifying ourselves because I'm right. We work independently only thing that gets seen is what I, what, I, what I can do. If we work cooperatively, you say, look what God did. How in the world did God put those people together to do that good work? That's what happens when we cooperate. Jesus asked, Jesus' disciples asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? What, did, what was his answer? We all know his answer. The person who is a servant and willing to serve without regard for their own needs. Growing up, valuing what each other can give, remaining humble and partnering with God. These are the ways, these are the marks of a lucky dog. 
I've said it every week to you. You are a bunch of lucky dogs, friends. <laughs> Let's go play well together in all our backyards. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I pray. And that's how this pastor understands the word of God for you, the people of God on this day. We all said, amen. Oh.